It is a joy to be with Canon Debbie Riles today, our Canon for Native American Ministries in the Episcopal Diocese of Arizona. And we're gonna start with a prayer. So let us pray. Creator, we give you thanks for all that you are and all that you bring to us for our visit within your creation. In Jesus, you place the gospel at the center of this sacred circle through which all creation is related. You show us the way to live a generous and compassionate life. Give us your strength to live together with respect and commitment as we grow in your spirit. For you are God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for having me here with you, Bishop. This has been a journey. Tennis, but it's good to spend some time in conversation and to share um, your wisdom and my learnings with the diocese for our anti-racism training. So tell me one of the goals of Sacred Ground and one of the goals of the anti-racism training is to be able to understand the doctrine of discovery. So tell me about your experience of the doctrine of discovery and how it's not just something in the past, but something in the present. Um, the doctrine of discovery um, has some language in it that um, I think that is important for us to uh, think about. And this language has been disturbing uh, to me for such a long time because it um, it's the ground work, right, for all the reasons why there's so much, um, so much permission to treat people the way we treat them, and that is the language is plenary power. So plenary power refers to a government's complete and ultimate power to make decisions for everyone that falls under that guideline. And Native people in the Doctrine of Discovery and throughout history, um, the U.S. government has put in place plenary power. So plenary power affects me personally in areas of, say, for instance, um, citizenship. So we talk about uh, citizenship, and if you ask me my citizenship, my first citizenship is to the Pasquayaki people. And how does my being Pasquayaki, how is it determined? So according to the guidelines that have been set by the federal government and this plenary power, they have decided that we are either a tribe or not a tribe based on blood quantum. How much blood, how much of my blood is Pasquayaki? And yet, as a Pasquayaki person, that is not how our tribe determines citizenship or membership. Our determination is based on relationship. So that's one of the first things. And I always say this because I remember the first time that I heard it, and it was so, it just hit me so hard um, that there are only two places where blood quantum is important, and that's in pedigrees of dogs and in Indians. And if you think about it in terms of that in our life and the way that we function, that, that we're on that level of identity, of who we are, it's based on our blood quantum or our pedigree. Um, so that's one of the very first places. The second are our uh, religious rights. Um, and my, again, uh, oftentimes uh, challenge is trying to describe to people uh, when they say to me or ask me a question like you have in the past, you know, about my religion. My religion is the Pasquayaki religion. Um, I am, that is who I am. That's how God made me. And that's the values and the principles that I follow. Um, and then, of course, the natural question beyond that has to be that how can you be an Episcopal priest, right? Well, and that's where I think that we begin to see differences in how we describe ourselves. My being an Episcopal priest is not any different than being Pasquayaki. It's all the same. You call it different. It, there are different recognitions and processes to get to that place, but they are all the same. We identify all the same values, the same principles, the same beliefs. Our uh, stories of Jesus walking with us 
um, are parallel to those that are written in the New Testament in the Bible. Um, so it's differentiation that somebody else makes, but that I don't personally make or people in my community don't make. They don't see any difference uh, going to a Baptist church or a Catholic church or an Episcopal church, except the way that the services are done or for led or who's in charge and those kinds of things. But other than that, Christianity and being Pasquayaki are all the same. And a lot of tribes will tell you that exact same thing. So Debbie, what steps as an institution would you like to see the church take to address both the systemic racism within the church, but you know specifically our witness to Native peoples in Arizona? I think we've already begun to take those steps, and I'm uh, so very grateful uh, for that. Um, the most important piece is recognition. Uh, many years ago, when, a, again, General Convention passed a resolution um, that was called the three R's, recognition, rec uh, remembrance, and reconciliation, um, we have renewed that resolution. Uh, there's been more than a decade. In fact, there have been more than two decades of uh, remembrance, recognition, and resolution. And yet there isn't any visible sign that anything has changed. Um, when I came um, into this position as the Canon for Native Ministry, I met with the first uh, group with the Council for Native American Ministry and we together tried to decide what would be the most important first step for us to take. Um, we decided upon that, uh, the three R's, and adding to it because uh, we were talking in the diocese about knowing who our neighbor is, um, uh, relationship. Um, the second thing that I think is, is important for us is to work very hard at breaking this pattern that we have in the church of taking care of the poor Indians. Um, you know, and I say that, and I know it's hard for people to hear, and when I meet with people in congregations and I talk with them and they want so desperately to reach out, particularly uh, recently in this year when we've had the COVID pandemic and there have been such huge needs, People want to do something, and um, and that's great. But if that's the only thing that people want to do, then it becomes a problem. So the way of understanding that a relationship goes both ways, everybody has something to give, and everybody has something to get. That's right. And what would you like to see the Episcopal Church in Arizona doing to heal some of the wounds that are still open? I think this is the hardest part for us. Um, because it may take us for a while to be able to get to a place where, as we noted in doing sacred ground, having those conversations and letting people talk about their feelings um, is an absolute necessity in order for us to find healing and, and reconciliation. Um, again, you know, our first steps in recognition, forming relationships, and finding ways to. Um, relate to each other is a good step, but at some point there has to be some conversations with people who have been deeply affected. Um, I remember a few years ago we talked um, at a gathering at the cathedral and uh, Dorothy Saucedo was um, talking about her experience with the boarding school, uh, and it was so hard for the people who were there to hear about that experience directly from somebody who had the experience. But yet I believe that those people, many of them that I still recall being at that meeting, are still active in the diocese and native ministry because they were moved to knowing something more than what they know. So I'd like to see us figure out, continue to find ways to have those difficult conversations with people. Why don't you describe a little bit the Council for Native American Ministries? Because I will say, as the bishop, when I moved here, I wasn't sure if that was something that I, as a white person, would be invited to participate in. So if you could explain that, I think it might help 
raise the profile a little bit. Whatever we do should be reflective of Native values. And that's where the idea of the Council for Native Ministry was born because most uh, Native entities that have organizations will call them councils, councils of advice, councils of uh, reference, councils for governance, councils of elders. Um, so we call ourselves the Council for Native American Ministry. Uh, we also said that um, this diocese needs to honor Native ministry in a way that is all-inclusive, uh, which has been the basis of all of my ministry development uh, over the years. And that, that I have this little thing that I say, I don't check anybody's Native card at the door, and I don't check their Episcopal card at the door. Because if they're there, they need to be there, and whatever drew them there is not for me to question. Uh, so we are open. The diocese is made up, um, the Council for Native Ministry is made up of members of our congregations, um, both Native and non-Native. Uh, we have uh, people in our congregations um, who are not attending the council meetings but are active in Native ministry in their uh, congregations, and so they've decided to send representatives to the council rather than all of them showing up, but they'd all be welcome. Um, and we have Native people who are not Episcopalians in our, on our Council for Native American Ministry. Um, so it is open, and it is our attempt, again, to continue to live into the three R's with the fourth R relationship. One of the things that the diocese does very well in some places and less well in others that I notice as the bishop, since I go to all of our different churches, is the acknowledgement of the people of the land as part of the prayers of the people on their bulletins and on their websites. How does it make you feel as a native person when you hear an acknowledgement in worship or you know, on a website or in something like that? I'll never forget the first time that I was in a congregation when my tribe was mentioned. Um, and I was there not as the leader of the worship, but and attending a diocesan event, and they had written it into it. Um, and I felt so good and noticed, and like I was really present. Uh, my whole self, all of me, not just the Episcopal priest side of me, but the Pasquayaki woman I am. Uh, we just finished our winter talk gathering, uh, which happened virtually, and um, Kimball Shorty, our representative on the Council of Advice for the Native Missioner for the Episcopal Church, was doing his report. And the first thing he mentioned to everybody was our diocesan convention. He said, I'll never forget that diocesan convention. He said, when our bishop opened the convention by recognizing the traditional people of the land. And everybody, you know, the folks throughout the Episcopal Church who were on that call, you could hear the little, like, oh, you know, that feeling of, it's hard to describe when somebody tells you they see you for the first time. One of the things that you and I have talked about sometimes is that you feel invisible. I not only feel invisible, but I also um, still experience shame uh, by people in congregations or places that I go in the diocese if I stand out. Uh, so I will always get comments. For instance, you notice when I go places, I dress obviously that I'm native. Um, and I will hear people will say things to me like, I love your costume. Um, I've uh, had people say to me, um, okay, now we get your native. Now let's get on with things. Um, you know, it's that kind of... Um, feeling that it's not okay to be who I am, and it's not okay to make sure that you know who I am. Um, 
So it's very easy in those situations. When we think about uh, historical trauma, we talk about it a lot in our Native uh, circles. Um, historical trauma has been passed on, yes, because of things of the past, but if we look at it from the present perspective, we're still traumatizing people that are different than us by those what we call microaggressions, right? The things that we say about them or to them. I, I don't know why, well, I do know why. I wish that people could see all of me and recognize that I am like you and like all the folks that I'm around. And I celebrate the fact that I still know who I am. I also, we all have a lot to learn. And thank you for sharing so much with me today. Thank you, Bishop. I really appreciate you and the opportunity for this diocese to really move forward and to take some steps for ourselves, because I do believe that we will be better Christians having made the journey through these conversations because they're not going to be easy, but they are going to heal us. Anything that gets us closer to healing is of God. Amen to that. Thank you. Leo Sinchian, Yavu Bishop.